Hi, I'm Linda Reimer, one of the librarians at the Southeast Sabine County Library. Welcome to Library Connections, our weekly readers, viewers, and listeners advisory video cast. Enjoy. Library Connections number 46. This is the Friday, March 26th, 2021 edition of Library Connections. Kicking things off as usual with the top five fiction bestsellers of the week from the New York Times at number one. Win by Harlan Coben. Windsor Horn Lockwood III might rectify cold cases connected to his family that have eluded the FBI for decades. At number two. Wild Sign by Patricia Briggs, the sixth book in the Alpha and Omega series. Mated werewolves Charles Cornick and Anna Latham look into what might have caused everyone living in a small town to disappear. At number three, The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. As dust storms roll during the Great Depression, Elsa must choose between saving the family and farm or heading west. At number four, Later by Stephen King. An NYPD detective asks the son of a struggling single mother to use his unnatural ability to track a killer. And at number five, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. Nora Seed finds a library beyond the edge of the universe that contains books with multiple possibilities of the lives one could have lived. And while wow, we've got three fantasy books in the top five, that's pretty impressive. I am a fantasy fan, I must admit. So having said that, let's move on to the nonfiction bestsellers. And moving on to the top five nonfiction bestsellers for the week. At number one, This is the Fire by Don Lemon. The CNN host looks at the impact of racism on his life and prescribes ways to address systemic flaws in America. At number two, The Codebreaker by Walter Isaacson. How the Nobel Prize winner Jennifer Doudna and her colleagues invented CRISPR, a tool that can edit DNA. At number three, Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. The Academy Award winning actor shares snippets from the diaries he kept over the last 35 years. At number four, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist examines aspects of caste systems across civilizations and reveals a rigid hierarchy in America today. And at number five, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster by Bill Gates. A prescription for what business, governments, and individuals can do to work towards zero emissions. Our first recommended read for this week is nonfiction, and it's on an important subject. The subject is caregiving. The book is called Already Toast, Caregiving and Burnout in America, written by Kate Washington. Journalist Washington's timely debut chronicles how quickly she and her husband's lifestyle shifted from married professionals and parents to caregiver and patient after her husband's diagnosis of a rare form of lymphoma. From 2016 to 2018, Washington served as a full-time aide to her husband, 
which had her battling insurance companies, making hospital appointments, and managing his care at home, all while trying to eke out a little extra time for herself. While working diligently as a caregiver, Washington felt alone, not realizing that there are thousands of others in similar positions all across the United States. The author highlights the necessity of providing more resources to caregivers, especially as baby boomers age. She additionally notes that nearly three quarters of caregivers are women, which underscores the importance of reform and the societal expectations that place women at the heart of caregiving. Washington also takes care to explore the racial dynamics of caregiving with Black and Latinx women often serving in caregiving roles while also caring for children. Verdict. This moving, relatable story is sure to resonate with patrons who, if not already serving as a caregiver, may find themselves taking on that role soon enough. A recommended purchase for library collections, and that is the Library Journal Review. Our second recommended read for this week is much lighter in tone than the first. This is a mystery novel with humor. The book's called Family Jewels, and it's written by Denise Grover Swank. Trouble always comes to those who court it. Rose Gardner's ability to see glimpses of the future has gotten her into hot water time and again, but so have her curiosity and her sense of daring. Those very qualities helped her defeat the most powerful man in Arkansas, a man so adept at hiding his crimes, there was no way to defeat him inside of the law. But her success came at a steep personal price. Now, she's throwing herself into her landscaping business, trying to live a life that's as orderly as one of her gardens. Rose's best friend, Neely Kate, is struggling with her own losses. So when she suggests they help a local man find a missing necklace, Rose agrees. It'll give both of them a welcome distraction. And besides, it's a simple investigation. What harm could possibly befall them? But things that should be simple rarely are. And if you wonder what the extra noises are, I have two cats who are my assistants this afternoon. So let me start reading that paragraph again. What harm could possibly befall them are heroines perhaps two cats trying to help them, but I digress. Things that should be simple rarely are. In seeking out the necklace, Rose and Neely Kate find themselves in the thick of a power struggle in the Fenton County underworld, one that could possibly dethrone Rose's friend, James Malcolm, the surprisingly moral king. The last thing Rose should do is court more trouble, but she's not the type to step away from a friend in need. 
and she's also not so sure she wants an orderly life. This is the first book in the Rose Gardner investigation series. Our first audiobook recommendation for this week is a terrific memoir that's been out for a number of years and is brand new now in the digital catalog as a downloadable audiobook, obviously. It's called Angela's Ashes. It's written and read by Frank McCourt. A Pulitzer Prize winning number one New York Times bestseller, Angela's Ashes, is Frank McCourt's masterful memoir of his childhood in Ireland. Quote, when I look back on my childhood, I wonder how I managed to survive at all. It was, of course, a miserable childhood. The happy childhood is hardly worth your while. Worse than the ordinary miserable childhood is the miserable Irish childhood. And worse yet is the miserable Irish Catholic childhood. So begins the luminous memoir of Frank McCourt, born in Depression-era Brooklyn to recent Irish immigrants and raised in the slums of Limerick, Ireland. Frank's mother, Angela, has no money to feed the children since Frank's father, Malachi, rarely works, and when he does, he drinks his wages. Yet Malachi, exasperating, irresponsible, and beguiling, does nurture in Frank an appetite for the one thing that he can provide, a story. Frank lives for his father's tales of Caluin, who saved Ireland, and of the angel on the seventh step, who brings his mother babies. Perhaps it is story that accounts for Frank's survival. Wearing rags for diapers, begging a pig's head for Christmas dinner, and gathering coal from the roadside to light a fire, Frank endures poverty, near starvation, and the casual cruelty of relatives and neighbors, yet lives to tell his tale with eloquence, exuberance, and remarkable forgiveness. Angela's ashes imbibed on every page with Frank McCourt's astounding humor and compassion is a glorious book that bears all the marks of a classic. And this one I have read and I have also listened to the audiobook down the years. If you haven't read it or listened to it, check it out. It's a great story. Our second audiobook recommendation for this week is a light title. This is a fantasy novel. It's called Betwixt, written by Dorinda Jones and read by Tracy Odom. Divorced, desperate, and destitute, former restaurateur Defiance Dane finds out she has been bequeathed a house by a complete stranger. She is surprised, to say the least, and her curiosity gets the better of her. She leaves her beloved Phoenix and heads to one of the most infamous towns in America, Salem, Massachusetts. She's only there to find out why a woman she's never met would leave her a house, a veritable castle that has seen better days. The lawyer assigned to the case practically begs her to take it off her hands, mostly because she's afraid of it. The inanimate structure that as far as defiance could tell has never heard a fly, though it does come with some baggage. A pesky neighbor who wants her gone, a scruffy cat who's a bit of a jerk, and a handyman bathed in ink who could moonlight as a supermodel for GQ. She decides to give it three days, and not because of the model. She feels at home in Salem, safe, 
but even that comes to a screeching halt when people begin knocking on her door day and night, begging for her help to locate their lost objects. Come to find out, they think she's a witch. And after a few mysterious mishaps, Defiance is beginning to wonder if they're right. So if you're looking for a light fantasy, check this one out. It's a lot of fun. Our first streaming recommendation for this week is the TV series Good Girls. Seasons one through three are available through Netflix, Amazon, and other streaming platforms. Creator Jenna Bands, previously of Desperate Housewives and Scandal, brings her soapy, creative chops to this unlikely network dramedy about three housewives, sisters Beth and Annie, and their friend Ruby, who turned to burglary when put in a financial bind, mortgage defaulting, losing custody of her child, and health care crises respectively. Christina Hendricks, Mae Whitman, and Retta Starr. Why you should watch it. Good Girls is nothing if not tonally adventurous, finding a ripe balance between high stakes, heartbreaking drama, bits of fish out of water levity, and criminal thrills. Throw in a trio of layered performances from Hendrix, Whitman, and Retta, all of whom are always welcome presences on screen, and it's no wonder the series is going three years strong. And that review is from Rotten Tomatoes. Also of note, season four of the series is currently showing on NBC. Our second streaming recommendation for this week is the new series Invisible City, available through Netflix. This intriguing TV series is set in Brazil and relays the story of a detective, his family, and mythological creatures found in Brazilian folklore that turn out to be real. After a brief prologue featuring a supernatural fireman, the series opens with husband and environmental detective Eric seen working at home while his wife Gabrielle and their daughter Luna are shown at a party in a nearby village. Luna walks into the forest and just as Gabrielle realizes that Luna is missing, a fire breaks out in the forest. Gabrielle runs into the forest looking for Luna. In the aftermath, Luna is found alive and well and Gabrielle is found dead on the forest floor. But did Gabrielle really die due to smoke inhalation? Or is something else going on? Eric believes the latter. And after he picks up a dead dolphin found on the beach, the supernatural world infiltrates his life in ways he cannot even imagine. So if you'd like to binge watch a new fantasy series, Check this one out, Invisible City, available through Netflix. Our third streaming recommendation for this week is the new film Moxie, available through Netflix. Burlington native Amy Poehler has another hit on her hands with Moxie, which reached the top spot on Netflix following its recent debut. Directed and produced by Polar, the coming-of-age tale follows Vivian, a shy 16-year-old who tends to keep her head down whilst in the halls of her high school. Inspired in part by the arrival of a new student and by her activist mother's rabble-rousing past, Vivian begins to reckon with the previously unchecked behavior of her fellow students by publishing an underground zine that puts her at the center of a school-wide revolution. Along with a cast of teenage newcomers, 
Moxie also features Clark Gregg, Ike Barholtz, and Marcia Gay Harden. And that is the Boston.com review. And finally, on a really, really silly note, a sequel to the TV series The Brady Bunch. Did I mention it was silly? It's the movie A Very Brady Sequel from 1996, available now through Amazon Prime Video. Perfect for anyone who's done with WandaVision and still jonesing for a modern riff on an old sitcom idol, Arlene Sanford's fiercely anti-commercial sequel takes the warped satirical energy of its predecessor and cranks it up all the way to 11, resulting in a brilliant piece of silliness that manages to capture the scrappy madness of something like Wet Hot American Summer on a studio budget. A very Brady sequel is just one of those comedies in which every single person from George Glass to Zaza Gabor is on the same page. Every line delivery has a musical perfection to it and every joke is absurd enough to stretch the limits of where the next one might land. It can turn even the grayest of late winter afternoons into a sunshine day. And that's the Indie Wire overview, but I would have to agree, I have seen this one. It is very silly, so if you're in the mood for silly, a very Brady sequel will do the trick. And finally, our Hoopla recommendation for this week. This week I'm going to recommend an album. This one's a classic. It's the 1959 album What a Difference a Day Makes by the great jazz singer Dinah Washington. The album features the classic title track and 15 other songs and is available for instant checkout at hoopladigital.com. And moving on to our Odd Duck recommendation for this week. This Odd Duck's going to be a little longer than usual. Well, okay, actually it's probably going to be about three times as long as usual because I had somebody ask me two questions this last week that filter into something I'm passionate about and that is streaming of video content, that is TV shows and movies on demand, and how that all works. So we're going to talk about that in the form of talking about smart TVs and video streaming players in this uh, duck. And I do want to emphasize the on-demandness of it. That's one of the things I love best about streaming. It's on your schedule. So if I missed last week's episode of Masterpiece Theater on PBS, I can go to my smart TV, bring up the PBS app, and watch it whenever I want to. I don't have to be sitting at home at 9 o'clock on Sunday night to watch it. So having said that, let's dig right in. In fact, you could call this particular odd duck smart TVs and streaming video players in a nutshell. That's a good title for it. So the first question is the obvious one. What is a smart TV anyway? The answer is that a smart TV is internet ready and it is a TV that allows you to access TV shows and movies through the internet. That process is called streaming and streaming is in contrast to the traditional way of accessing TV shows and movies at home via a cable TV subscription that requires one to pay a monthly bill to a cable TV provider for example, Spectrum or Comcast, and has the TV content coming in via a TV cable connected to a cable box. With a smart TV, you just have to connect the TV to the internet. You don't need a cable box. Question, if you own a smart TV, how do you access TV shows and movies? Answer, smart TV navigation is like navigating on a smartphone or tablet. You open apps, which in the case of a smart TV are all video related, and then you scroll through lists of TV shows and movies and select the specific titles you want to watch. You can do this by using your remote, or if your device supports it, 
the keyboard on your smartphone or tablet. Question. I'm sure accessing TV shows and movies by a smart TV costs money, right? Answer. Although there are some TV shows, movies, and other video content that you can watch for free on a smart TV, it is true that most content does feature a price tag in one of two ways. The first way is a la carte. You buy TV shows and movies via an app store that sells them on a smart TV. Video store apps include Amazon, Apple, Vudu, YouTube, and Google. And average prices range from $1.99 for weekly TV episodes to $19.99 to buy a new movie. The second way to access TV shows and movies on a smart TV is by purchasing a subscription to a video library from a video subscription service. Video subscription services include Netflix, Amazon Prime, Google, CBS All Access, Discovery Plus, Hulu, Disney Plus, Acorn, and BritBox. Also of note, if you make an annual donation to PBS of $60 per year, you'll gain access to their Passport Library, which is a much more extensive video library than the free one available to everyone with an internet connection. On a free streaming note, the Southeast Bend County Library offers patrons access to a free streaming video service. All you need is a library card and an internet connection. The service is called Hoopla, and there is a Hoopla app available for mobile devices and smart TVs. Through Hoopla, you can access scores of TV shows and movies, all available for instant checkout. There is an item limit, it's six instant checkouts per month, and that is because although Hoopla is free to patrons, the library has to pay each time an item is checked out. However, it is a really cool service and I urge you to check it out. The Hoopla app, as you see on your screen, is blue with white lettering. So, media slash video streaming players, making a dumb TV smart. And basically, Video streaming players connect to both your home internet service and your TV, and they do indeed make your traditional or dumb TV a smart TV. If you have cable TV service, you can also use a video streaming player. You'll just switch between the smart TV menu and the cable TV menu by switching inputs on your remote control. You may also have to use two remotes if you do that, one that came with your cable box and the one that came with your streaming player. Video streaming players come with a remote and they are relatively small. They range from about the size of a flash drive to about the size of a large burger. You can find an entry level media streaming player for less than $30. Prices go up from there. And there are some high-end models that cost more than 200 bucks. But for most people, a less expensive media streaming player, also known as a video streaming player, will fit their needs just fine. The very cheapest models, like the Roku Express, Google Chromecast, and Amazon Fire TV Stick work just fine. They are a little bit slower than their more expensive counterparts, but if you're looking to simply try out the technology, they will work just fine. So here we see three basic entry-level video streaming players. The Roku Premiere, it comes with a remote, usually costs about $30, sometimes can be found for cheaper, as can the others on this list. The second one is the Amazon Fire TV Stick Lite with Alexa Voice Remote Lite. It too usually costs about $30 and comes with a remote. And you did read that right. It does have 
voice activation for searching, the light voice activation for searching, but it should do for most searches. And the third one on this list is the Google Chromecast third generation. That's the latest. It too usually costs $30, but note, this particular streaming player does not come with a remote. You are expected to use your smartphone to navigate the video menus, which if you have an Android phone is not a problem. I haven't tried that particular device and I have an iPhone, so I don't know how well that would work with a Chromecast, but I suspect there's an app for it and it would work. But just be aware, if you purchase the Google Chromecast, if you have an Android phone, you're all set. If you have a different kind of smartphone, you want to make sure that the Chromecast is supported by your smartphone so that you can actually search for videos to watch. Moving on, we have a selection of better video streaming players. These models have faster processors and or better storage and more features than the cheaper models. The first one is the Roku Streaming Stick Plus, costs $50, comes with a remote, and is optimized for high definition video. The second is the Roku Ultra. It is the high-end Roku model, top of their line. It costs $100, comes with a remote, is faster than the other Roku models, and supports 4K video, Bluetooth, a larger Wi-Fi range than the other Roku models, and it has a remote headphone input. And the third title on this list is the Amazon Fire Cube TV. It too comes with a remote. It also supports 4K video, and it can control select sound bars, stereo receivers, and cable and satellite boxes. I would do some research before buying one to make sure it works with your equipment. And as a special mentioned video streaming player, I want to bring your attention to the Apple TV 4K 64 gigabyte model. Despite the name of this thing, it is not actually a TV. It is a box that you see there on the left with the remote. The Apple TV 4K is a higher end streaming player. It works with 4K TVs, has a speedy processor, a high end remote that allows for both voice and gesture input, and it has a built-in microphone allowing you to search for shows and movies with your voice. The Apple TV 4K also features a great interface and crisp, clear pictures. Four things to consider when buying a smart TV or a video streaming player. One, the type of internet service you have. Two, the streaming ecosystem of the device you're considering. 3. Subscription streaming services and 4. Going cable TV free. 1. Internet service and streaming. The ideal type of internet service to purchase for streaming purposes is broadband service that has a flat monthly rate. Local flat rate internet service can be obtained from Empire Access at a rate of $50 per month, or from Spectrum, whose prices vary depending upon the package you select. In relation, if you're looking to switch internet service providers, make sure to check their coverage map to verify the area you live in is covered. Also, at the present time, Empire Access is only available for those who own the buildings they live in or are working in. You cannot currently obtain the service if you rent. Also of note, you can stream video content if your internet service comes from a satellite provider or other internet service that comes with a data cap. However, as most satellite internet service does come with a monthly data cap and streaming videos uses large amounts of data, you'll burn through your monthly cap quickly if you have that type of internet service. So it doesn't mean you can't stream if you have satellite service, but just be aware of the costs related to it. Two, 
Streaming ecosystems. Streaming ecosystems are something to consider before buying a video streaming player. And that fancy terminology means which companies that either make a video streaming player or have their streaming service featured on other players also create content to be watched through their players or their sponsored players. For example, Amazon and Apple both make video streaming players and both have studios that create new TV shows and movies. So if you buy one of their video streaming players, you'll find their created content is shown front and center, and some of it is exclusive. Netflix too has a streaming ecosystem, even though they don't make a player. Their service is featured on other equipment like Roku remotes, and Netflix too has a studio that makes exclusive TV shows and movies. Streaming ecosystems continued. Here's a second point to consider. If you own a smartphone or tablet, made for example by Apple or Google, and you've purchased video content before on that device, say you bought a movie from Apple and watched it on your iPhone, and then you subsequently purchased an Apple TV, you would find when you first log in to your Apple account on your new Apple TV, that the movie that you previously purchased is easily accessible by simply going to the movie menu on your Apple TV. So just to reiterate that, if you bought content on your phone or tablet, you're gonna find if you buy a media streaming player, also known as a video streaming player, by the same maker, so if you have an Android phone made by Google and you buy a Google Chromecast, you'll find the same thing. If you bought a TV show or a movie through Google and you just bought a new Chromecast and you log into it with your Google account, which is the same one you use for your smartphone, you're gonna find that any content video wise that you previously purchased is easily available through the menu on your Chromecast or you know Apple TV if you've got one. I hope that makes sense. That's a little bit hard maybe to wrap one's head around. It's about syncing content. I'll try and reiterate one more time. If you have a family of devices, sometimes it's good to keep your devices within the family. So if you've got an iPhone and an iPad and you've watched videos on them, you might wanna consider buying an Apple TV because any videos that you previously purchased from Apple are available through your Apple TV. Likewise, if you have an Android phone in an Android tablet and you bought TV shows or movies to watch on those devices, you might want to consider buying a Google Chromecast because you'll be able to access that same content without having to purchase it again. Three, subscription streaming services, the Cliff Notes version. Today, there are many streaming subscription services, too many to mention them all in a single video. So I'll just introduce you to a selection of the most popular ones. Netflix costs $13.99 per month. Netflix offers thousands of TV shows and movies, as well as Netflix studio created content. Hulu costs $5.99 per month to $70.99 per month, depending upon which streaming package is selected. Hulu offers access to live TV shows, via local networks and recent movies as well as select older TV series and new shows because Hulu has a bundle of TV channels included, which includes FX, TLC, TNT, Sci-Fi, and Nat Geo. Amazon Prime Video. Subscription cost is $12.99 per month or $119 annually. Select TV shows and movies as well as Amazon produced content. Note Amazon Prime also includes access to Amazon's basic streaming music library. And as you may very well know, it offers free shipping of Amazon purchased items in two days. So Amazon Prime isn't strictly a streaming video service, but they do have a streaming video library. 
And finally, on this page, Apple TV Plus cost is $4.99 per month. This relatively new service offers access to a growing list of newly produced videos, both TV shows and movies, made by Apple and in a variety of genres. Three, subscription streaming services, the Cliff Notes version, continued. PBS Passport, cost, $60 donation by month or annually. PBS Passport offers more than 1,500 PBS titles available on demand and sometimes offers access to new content before it's shown on PBS TV. For example, the last season of Poldark, I was able to watch all of it just as it was debuting on TV. Moving on to CBS All Access and Peacock, those obviously are two networks. CBS All Access costs $9.99 per month and features commercial free access to TV broadcast content, as well as select exclusives from CBS, including the new Star Trek series, Discovery and Picard. Peacock is free and offers NBC shows and movies, and it does feature commercials. And I should note, most streaming content is commercial free. If you watch videos through Netflix, for example, there's no commercials. And finally, if you're a fan of British TV, there are two great options for that, Acorn TV, which is $5.99 per month, and BritBox, which is $6.99 per month. Both services offer British TV shows and movies, lots of mysteries, some exclusive titles too. I recommend you check out the websites for each service to see the titles they offer before subscribing. And they do have things that come and go. You might find the TV series Shetland on BritBox now and maybe on Acorn TV later. And you can get a trial for any of these as well, so except for PBS Passport. So if you just wanted to check out what, for example, Netflix is like, you could get a trial subscription and try it before you subscribe. Okay, number four, going cable TV free. I will have to admit that saying bye-bye to traditional cable was one of the great joys in my life. But before saying goodbye to traditional cable TV service, it is a good idea to do some research and find out if the TV shows, local TV channels, genre movies, and other content, and especially sports, are available as streaming options through the device you're looking to buy. For example, they're not bundled to a cable TV subscription service, they're standalone. This might be a little confusing and I can understand why. This is also much less an issue than it once was. You can stream most TV shows and movies by purchasing titles a la carte or by purchasing a paid subscription service like Netflix. However, if you love sports, or local TV channels. You'll want to check and make sure you can get the content you want through a streaming media player, also known as a streaming video player, and that it isn't cost prohibitive. And I'm not a sports person, so you may think this is a terrific deal, I don't know, but for example, an MLB subscription to see all out-of-market teams play baseball costs $129 per month. I have no idea how many games that is per month. And if you're a huge baseball fan, maybe that's a small price to pay. It does seem like a lot to me. And I would speculate, although I don't know it for a fact, that you could probably find a lot of baseball games on cable TV. So just FYI. And question, what streaming equipment does Linda have? And that is a good question. I've been streaming without a cable subscription for about 15 years. And during that time, I have owned a number of Roku models, updating them every few years as newer models came out with improved features. I like the Roku players because they are more open. Roku doesn't produce TV shows or movies, they simply make players. So their ecosystem features more channels. Granted, 
Some of the channels are niche channels, but they do provide more channels and free content, including free music streaming channels like Pandora and TuneIn Radio. The last Roku model I owned was their highest end model, the 4K Roku Ultra. Their picture quality was very good, and I was pleased by the selection of video apps. Then three years ago, I decided I wanted a bigger screen, so I upgraded to a 4K smart TV. Specifically, I bought a 55-inch TLC Roku smart TV. This TV has the Roku interface built in, and it is a solid entry-level 4K TV, much better picture than HD TV. The picture quality is very good, and the video apps are the same ones that were available for my Roku Ultra, so I'm very happy with the TV. Also, as I like streaming videos, which no doubt you will have gathered if you've watched this presentation, I also bought, to no one's surprise, the 4K Apple TV, 64 gigabyte version. The picture quality is excellent, and I use it to watch previously purchased Apple content, as well as TV shows and movies, through the Amazon, PBS, Discovery, and YouTube apps. Also of note, I have an iPhone, and I've had several iPads, well, I've had several iPhones, so when I talked previously about being in an ecosystem, I'm sort of in the Apple ecosystem. So that's, you know, if you purchase the content for your TV or your smartphone or your tablet, you can watch it on all the other devices you have in that ecosystem, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, shoot me an email and I'll elaborate. Also of note, I have an indoor HD TV antenna. You put them up on the wall and it allows me to watch live content on the local ABC, CBS, and four different PBS stations, among a number of other channels that I don't watch. Usually I'll look at PBS if there's something on that's really good that I wanna watch right now. You can get it on demand, usually within an hour of it being shown on PBS, but if there's some special that my mother has called and said, hey, this is really good, flip to PBS, I could do it with my HD TV antenna. And that's the equipment that Linda has. So as a picture is worth a thousand words, as the saying goes, here are some pictures. At left you see the 55 inch TLC Roku Smart TV. Yes, that's what the interface looks like. You can navigate to the antenna or the cable box with your remote and go into the cable or antenna ecosystem, if you will. At right, you see the Apple TV interface on a TV screen. And at the very right, that's the latest Apple TV device. That's what I've got. And at the bottom, you see a selection of indoor HD TV antennas. They usually cost $25, $30. And you put them up on the wall, as I mentioned, and you can get local channels over the air. Not everything, but you can get the basic channels. And quickly, here are our references, because this has been quite a long video. Have a great week, everyone. And that's the program for this week. I'll be back next week with a new edition of Library Connections, including an odd duck that offers a tour of the Apple TV and Roku Smart TV. Have a great day.